everyone. Welcome on in to Drinks with Binks. I'm your host, Julie Stewart Binks, and I'm so thrilled to be joined by one of my good friends and Sports Illustrated writer, Grant Wall. Grant, thank you for being with us here today. We know you are uh, a veteran of being on Fubo Sports Network at this point. <laughs> I've been on both shows, yours and the Cooligans. Yes. So, uh, very, very happy to be yeah, here. Yeah, and then we'll have to get you on my other show, which is a little bit wackier at some point <laughs> okay, later on. I would like that. Um, uh, but then we'll have to start paying you because you've been on all these shows so much. But um, it's great to have you here. We know you're super busy, but uh, you have so many great stories to tell us through soccer, covering basketball, Sports Illustrated. We're going to get into all that. But as the moniker of the show is Drinks with Binks, what are we going to be drinking today, Grant? We are going to be drinking a Mezcal Negroni, which is my drink of choice, whether I'm here in New York or out on the road. And... Um, Big fan of it. Great. I love love a good Mezcal Negroni. And wow, we uh, we seem to have them already here. Hey. So um, let's let's just cheers. And cheers. We'll take a little Great to be here with take you. a little sip. Well done. Yeah, that is whoever quite, made that. That is pretty good. Our our whole staff is learning how to be bartenders at the same point too. Always it's, good to pick up new skills. Yes. And where are we going to be drinking these drinks today? So Buenos Aires is my adopted city and my adopted country of Argentina, and this is an Italian drink, but there's obviously a very big Italian influence in Buenos Aires. So imagine that we are sort of in the La Boca area of, of Buenos Aires. Oh, that sounds well. Hey! Downtown. Nice, are, it's the obelisk. Yes, and I mean, we're I, I've never been there before, so seeing these images, of course, for Boca Juniors. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned it's your adopted city. What does that mean? It is the place where I've probably spent the most time outside the United States over the years. Uh, I lived in Buenos Aires for three months uh, back in college when I was doing my oh, wow. I did my senior thesis on politics and soccer in Argentina. Um, and so it's literally the first country I went to outside of the United States. I never left the U.S. until I was 20, 21 years old oh in college. And um, so I've traveled with the Boca Juniors fans. Uh, I go there on vacation quite a bit with my wife, who thankfully likes it a lot. Uh, it's a wonderful place. What, what stands out to for people who haven't been there before? What is sort of the, the crux of it? Well, for one, it's a great soccer country. And, and Buenos Aires is a great soccer city. Uh, obviously, I'm into soccer. Um, but it's just a very passionate country. You know, they're passionate about basically everything they do, whether it's soccer, whether it's tango, um, whether it's just about anything. And um, just a cool place, too, to visit. Um, you know, it's a little bit like New York, but it's got its own spin and, and history. Right. And um, so I was there earlier this year uh, for a, an SI video that uh, it was really cool sort of to reconnect actually with a lot of my friends from when I first went there in the 90s. Oh, I'm sure. And it's probably changed quite a bit too since then. It has, you know, uh, and I've changed too. I, you know, when I lived there as a student, I literally had spaghetti every night for three months because I couldn't afford anything else. And I, I w always remember uh, going to what, like an Argentine steakhouse for the first time down there. Ooh. Yeah, you know, and I couldn't afford the steak because I had no money, and so I, I ordered tripe, which is not something that I would actually. Uh, Todd suggest. Uh, on camera over there is so, groaning. Yeah, no, it's not good. Not great, right. but the Argentine steak, which I've had more recently down there, uh, it's wonderful. Okay, and uh, the fact that you have now traveled to so many different countries, when you said that was your first, it, it really speaks to the volume of of the breadth of what you've done with your career because we mentioned you you covered hoops that was sort of your first foray into sports broadcasting and stop me if i'm incorrect so yeah i got to sports illustrated in 1996 uh i can't believe i'm saying this i'm in my 24th year wow. there now um and i did college basketball uh as my main sport for about 13 years and i would do soccer on the side there just wasn't enough demand for full-time right. soccer for quite a while and so you know, one of the first big stories I did was our cover story on LeBron James mm. when he was a junior in high school back in 2002. And it was at a time when you could actually still sort of introduce someone like that to the country. Mm. Um, and uh, I couldn't believe it actually when they decided to put LeBron on the cover because he wasn't guaranteed to make it by any means. I was covering Freddie Adu at around the same time oh, yeah. in the soccer yeah, world didn't who didn't make, make it. it. Um, but LeBron made it, and uh, and that cover was so special to him that the chosen one is what it said on the cover. He got as a tattoo on oh his my back. Gosh, that's so cool. And so you know, like 
I do wish I don't have any photographs of that reporting trip of, of like me and LeBron when he was a high school junior because cell phones you know, didn't really have cameras back then. And so it's in the memory, at least. And I have the magazine to show like that you know, has got to be such it. a cool career moment for you. It was. I mean, in every year, it kind of even more so um, comes back because we got him at, at I think, the right time um, to to really do something that people remember. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of memories, we wanted to toast to two fantastic careers in soccer that have come to an end this week, DeMarcus Beasley and Tim Howard. Yeah. And we have both covered them, you more so than I, but we wanted to, to toast to Cheers, two guys. incredible Americans. So upwards and onwards to new beginnings. I don't know what people say these days anymore. Pretty but. amazing careers though. And I remember uh, doing a magazine story on Tim Howard in 2003 when he was signed by Manchester United from the oh, Metro right, yeah. Stars. And it was this amazing success story that came out of nowhere. Uh, I remember covering DeMarcus Beasley at the 2002 World Cup when he was 20 years old and, and he and Landon Donovan uh, helped take the U.S. to the quarterfinals. Mm -hmm. um, I've been doing this long enough that you get to, to know people as you follow them over the years and cover them. And so... Um, even a guy like DeMarcus Beasley, uh, I don't think enough U.S. soccer fans realize uh, he's probably the most successful American ever in UEFA Champions League. Right. You know, he was playing for a PSV team that got to the semifinals in 2005. And the, like, there's been an addition of so many U.S. soccer fans in the last decade that there's not that many people that actually re were around to remember that. Mm -hmm. What would be something about both of these players that would, because of the time you spent with them and, and the time you spent covering them, that would surprise the average fan? Um, you know, like, I think people sort of take for granted what Tim Howard did to overcome Tourette syndrome. Hmm. Um, because this was a serious thing to have. There's not many athletes at a high level who've had it. Um, it's something that if you talk to him about growing up that he got made fun of for, for the twitches and, and the various things that, um, that he's had to deal with on that. Uh, I remember when he first signed with Manchester United, the British tabloids had stories that had literal headlines. Uh, Man United signs disabled goalkeeper. Oh my gosh. And and so he's had to deal with that and overcome it. And he's become a real inspiration for especially kids with Tourette's mm -hmm. uh, around the country, around the world at this point. And he's really taken that on as a, something that he wants to do, spend a lot of time with that. But we've seen Tim Howard do so many amazing things over the years mm -hmm. that I think even someone like me, like I, I've sort of taken for granted what he's done to overcome that and actually mm -hmm. what he still does to overcome it because he's on he takes medication he does and, okay i yeah. mean it's not really something that many people i would say know about a, a lot especially in the last couple of years because it's he's he doesn't talk about it as much as probably he did when it was sort of more prominent in his life or when the tabloids are bringing it up and whatnot so and his foundation does a lot of kind of work that tim doesn't put out too publicly, mm -hmm. but really impressive guy. Yeah, definitely. Well, we will discuss more about U.S. soccer to Marcus Beasley when we come back after a quick timeout. This is Drinks with Binks, and we are drinking and binking with Grant Wall today. Welcome on back to Drinks with Binks. I'm JSB, and we've got Grant Wall from Sports Illustrated. Planet Football, you were with Fox for many years. You've been all over the place doing a ton of different stuff within soccer. We were just talking about Tim Howard and, and memories and information of that would surprise fans about him. And I also had asked you, but had to cut you off, about DeMarcus Beasley. So um, you mentioned just his his impact in UEFA Champions League, but what would be something for fans that would that would surprise them about him as a player or a person? Well, I mean, for a long time, 
people wondered if DeMarcus would even be the best player in his family. One of the first stories I ever wrote for Sports Illustrated was on Jamar Beasley, which uh, he is uh, the older brother of DeMarcus, and he was a prospect too as a forward. Um, and, you know, sports being sports, Jamar kind of didn't make it. You know, he, he became a professional and played um, for several years in different leagues, uh, mostly minor leagues. Um, but I always remember right around that time when I wrote that story on Jamar, and that was like late 90s, people told me, oh, I know people are talking about Jamar right now, but keep an eye on his younger mm -hmm. brother, DeMarcus, because DeMarcus might end up being quite good. And obviously that ended up being the case. And, um, you know, I remember in 99 that DeMarcus Beasley and Landon Donovan actually won the top two individual awards at the under 17 yeah. World Cup. And, uh, the U.S. had gotten to the semifinals there. And so um, we kind of take for granted, you know, like DeMarcus Beasley and, and Landon Donovan and those guys, but we haven't really produced that many players since then who were that good. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think as the years go by that, that we'll appreciate uh, Beasley even more. Which is a good and bad thing because you would think yeah. with some of these players playing in the Premier League, playing in Europe, that it would have had uh, maybe and it, it's had an effect on players over here, but we would have seen more growth and more inroads of American players over there, which we're going to talk about in just a second. And the fascinating thing, though, about DeMarcus Beasley, because I started covering all this stuff a bit later because, you know, I moved from Canada in 2013 to the States. But I found it so fascinating when uh, covering the Gold Cup in 2015 when DeMarcus Beasley came out of retirement for, mm -hmm. from the U.S. soccer because Jurgen Klinsmann wanted him to come for that Gold Cup that was very disappointing where they lost to Panama and he missed uh, the penalty at the end in, in, in the shootout. But he uh, he is really gone. <laughs> like, he, just when you think he's going to retire, it was like, no, he's still got a couple of years of gas left in the tank. So. And I'm not totally ready to write off him being done playing mm. because there were some things that DeMarcus Beasley said about the Houston Dynamo and they're not being as ambitious as he wanted them to be. And that was part of the influence on him retiring. We've seen players announce their retirements before and come back, including Landon Donovan. Um, you know, we'll see about, I think there's a, I think there's a 10 to 20% chance that we could see DeMarcus Beasley playing again. And that is because of those comments that he mentioned. I, I think, you know, we'll have to wait and see what comes next for him. I know he wants to, to work in a front office and, and maybe the Dynamo ends up being the place where he mm -hmm. does that. But, um, uh, yeah, I am not totally ready to end his career. <laughs> yeah. You, you just never know with some yeah. of these guys and the Landon Donovan model is correct as he, Kept coming back. And Brett was, Favre style. Yes, yeah. It was. It's exciting to see some of these players. If, if you still have it, you might as well keep going. Now, we talk about these players that are leaving and that are no longer going to be with the U.S., supposedly. Right now, the U.S. is playing Cuba. We are. It is Friday night. We're, we have taped this earlier, just we're not lying or anything. But, Grant, how would you 3-0 loss to Mexico, draw against Uruguay, where are they right now? I mean, I, I think this is a long process for the U.S. men's national team to to be respected again and to gain the respect that they had more around 2014 World Cup, 2010 World Cup. But when you fail to qualify for the 2018 World Cup, that was the biggest disaster in the history of U.S. soccer. Mm -hmm. No, no debate about that. And so the U.S. men's national team isn't going to recover respect until they get to the World Cup, qualify for 2022, and then do pretty well there. That's what it's going to take. And so that's a long process. And, um, you know, Greg Berhalter is now the coach. Uh, his first big tournament was the Gold Cup this summer. They lost to Mexico in the final. Um, and, you know, losing to Mexico 3 nothing in a friendly last month has fans upset. And I get it. And so I think the jury's still out on, on Greg Berhalter and, and what he's doing with this U.S. team. I think he has the possibility to be a success. I think Greg Berhalter's a smart guy. Um, and there's just questions right now about talent on the U.S. team. Is there enough? Mm -hmm. um, how do you get this team back to where it was like a top 
15 top 20 team in the world because they're not that right now. Right. So then what, and, and we don't have a whole lot of time to discuss this right now before going to break, but what's one thing that gives you confidence they are going in the right direction and one thing that tells you they aren't going in the right direction? Well, one thing that gives me confidence is when you see young players, 20 years old, 21, Christian Pulisic, Tyler Adams, Weston McKinney, uh, players like that who are in Europe and uh, are very talented and promising and very, very young still, um, that gives me some, some hope for the future, and I think for the fans too. Um, in, in terms of like a negative, I guess the question would be, are there enough of those guys mm. right now? And why has... The ML, you know, MLS has spent so much money supposedly on development and academies. How come we haven't seen more really good young talent coming out of those MLS academies? Because I don't think we've seen as much as I thought we would have by now. What, what do you think is the answer to that? It could be coaching, not enough good coaching. Um, it, it could be that not enough MLS teams are, are really prioritizing youth development. Uh, a few clubs are, but not that many um and you know you just we'll have to wait and see it's not just about spending money right it definitely needs some talent here in the u.s uh we're going to talk more about the u.s men's national team u.s women's national team and a whole lot more on drinks with Banks. so stay tuned we've got grant wall with us Hi, I'm Taylor Rooks, and I had drinks with Binks. Welcome on back. It's Drinks with Binks. I'm Julie Stewart Binks. We've got Grant Wall here with us today, and we were just discussing the U.S. men's national team, which is uh, always interesting these days because it's not where we want it to be. We're not sure how to get it back to the quote-unquote glory days, which still as a country as big as the u.s should be well beyond where we are right now i think so you know and i think what the u.s team on the men's side at least has lost in the last several years is this idea of being really difficult to play against that when the u.s men have done their best over the years whether it was the 2002 world cup getting to the quarterfinals or the 2010 world cup or even parts of the 2014 world cup there was a they were their collective was better than the individual talents mm -hmm. put together and i think that's been the hallmark of, of really good u.s men's teams i think that was lost to a, lot, a big extent under jurgen klinsman uh jurgen did some good things um but uh i, I think as a day-to-day -day coach um wasn't great mm -hmm. um and clearly the team had quit on him when he got fired and then um, I think they should have made a move earlier than they right. did because then when they finally fired Klinsman, it was in the middle of World Cup qualifying and there was no margin for mess. error. And it ends up being a disaster. And, and Bruce Arena deserves some blame for that as well. Um, so um, where's the U.S. right now? I think you kind of have to measure yourself against your biggest regional rival. That's Mexico. And right now the U.S. is pretty far behind Mexico. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it doesn't seem as though they're, I mean, you mentioned some of these great players, these young players who are playing abroad. That is, is sort of the future. But we always keep coming back to this. Well, how do we do it in the U.S.? And like development and is it MLS clubs needing to have uh, these academies and do more? And, and no one seems to know the answer, though, or at least they think they know the answer, but nothing seems to translate. Well, it's just they have different approaches. Um, different clubs do. Uh, MLS you know, talks a pretty good game about the millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars that their clubs have spent on development. Um, but, you know, just look right now and, you know, how many new really good forwards have we seen break through for the U.S. in the last decade? You know, Josie Altidore is still the best one, and, and he's had a, a good career. Um, he's been good for the national team. Um, but, you know, he's hurt right now, and if Jossie Zardes is kind of your best option, that's not a great sign. Uh, Josh Sargent is a guy that I'm excited about playing for Werder Bremen in uh, Germany. Uh, young guy who's getting opportunities, and I think he's going to be probably the, the guy to watch as a, as a striker moving forward mm -hmm. for the U.S. national team. Um, but we'll see. And, uh, of course, Christian Pulisic, who was listed as a midfielder on this latest call-up squad in your book, Masters of Modern Soccer. Very fascinating, the nice. conversations that you had with him in there. And, and all of them, I, 
with Chevy was incredible as brain. These guys, you ask the right questions because you're, you're a great journalist and you've you've been around. You know you know the game so well, and being able to ask these guys the right questions and then the responses that they elicit. When you talk to Christian Pulisic, because we we know him, we see him. He's this wonder kid, and and all of the future of the U.S. is riding on him. What stood out about about his soccer brain? Uh, that it was very advanced. Even when we did these interviews over a two-year period, he was 17 and 18 years old. And this book is about the craft of soccer, position by position. So uh, I pick one person to represent goalkeeper, mm -hmm. defender, defensive midfielder, attacking midfielder, forward coach, and director of football. And Christian Pulisic is the attacking midfielder. And uh, it was interesting because he held his own in this book with people like Shabby Alonso, World Cup winner, yeah. Uh, in his mid 30s, uh, he's done playing now, but like, you know, one of the smartest, best players in his position of all time. And here's Christian Pulisic. And I was a little concerned heading into it. Like, I, I wanted to get an American. I thought this kid was it. Um, and he was really smart. And these interviews that we did were a lot of fun for me because it's crazy how rarely we actually ask players to talk in depth about what they're an expert at, right. which is playing the sport. You know, we have these other stories we're following or we're talking about a particular game. Mm -hmm. And so Polisic and I would literally sit down, as I did with all the other people, for an hour and a half and watch video together of oh. him playing and get into real detail about how he does what he does on the field. What's going through your mind? What are you considering doing in this moment? What are your options? How do you decide what you're going to do? Um, and it revealed a lot. And I, I, I felt like I picked good people for this book. Manuel Neuer is the goalkeeper. Mm -hmm. Vincent Company is the defender. Uh, Chicharito Hernandez is the Just forward. Just to even get these interviews is It was hard. Yeah. It was hard. Xavi Alonso is the defensive midfielder. Roberto Martinez is the coach. And the Dortmund director of football is the director of football. Um, and these are world-class talents, but also in a very small percentage of people, maybe around 1% or 2% of athletes are really insightful at a high, high level mm -hmm. of explaining what they do. Like I've interviewed Lionel Messi, obviously a genius, amazing talent, but not great, like most athletes, mm -hmm. at putting into words that talent. Why do you think that is? Um, he doesn't necessarily think about it <laughs> yeah. all, all that much. Or maybe at this point he doesn't even, like it's, it's just, it's more action than mm -hmm. actual putting it into words. So like, the people who are in this book are the ones who a television network would hire to, for their studio exactly. shows to talk about the game. That's why Vincent Company and Roberto Martinez have done studio work for ESPN, because they're really, really smart. And so I was tickled that, that Christian Pulisic was able to, to be just fine and very analytical in the chapter that I have on him. Now, before we go to break, I want to talk a little bit more about Pulisic and that he hasn't been starting for Chelsea, but he's been doing quite well. And when you see, when you've got to spend ta uh, that much time with a talent like that, and now we see him in the Premier League, where, what kind of player do you see him developing into? Like, if you had to model what you see now off of someone you've already seen, who do you think it would be? That's a great question. I, like, we haven't seen anything like that in, in the U.S. necessarily, because here's a guy who uh, can play any of the sort of three attacking midfield positions, wide right, wide left, central, uh, we aren't totally sure exactly where his best mm -hmm. position might be, and it might be different for the U.S. national team than it is for his club team. Um, but vision, always wanting to advance the ball, to take risks, not to pass the ball sideways or behind, to try and make a difference is what he talks about in detail in, in a, my book. And um, I think right now, because he's just turned 21, yeah. it's still a, a bit about promise, right? Like, what is he going to be? What could he become? And he's not a finished product. He would tell you that. Uh, I think it's an odd situation he's in at Chelsea right now, where they spent $73 million on him. And yet, I don't think you're entitled to anything. And you have to earn your spot on the field. But I also think the current coach, Frank Lampard, is giving more opportunities right now to young English players. Mm -hmm. Some of them are doing pretty well, uh, granted. Um, but I think Christian Pulisic eventually will get 
significant time on the field there. And, and if that doesn't happen, situationally, sometimes things don't work out and you move elsewhere. There's a, a bunch of great former Chelsea players who didn't make it there but did elsewhere, like Mohamed Salah, Kevin De Bruyne, mm -hmm. um, you know, a few others too. And so we'll see what happens. Yeah, that's the hard part. You sometimes you're just at, uh, at the mercy of what the manager wants to do. And Frank Lampard, first time, well, not first time, but first time manager for for Chelsea, and it's very interesting seeing him be a player for in the Premier League for England and with the NYCFC yeah. because we saw him here in the U.S. All right, we got to take a quick time out, but we're going to be back with a whole lot more soccer and beyond on Drinks with Thanks with Grant Wall. Hey guys, welcome back to Drinks with Binks. I'm JSB. We've got Grant Wall from Sports Illustrated here, and we are drinking Mezcal Negronis. We've been very mature with our drinking. We've only sipped <laughs> so every far. so often um, because we have lots of things to talk about. And that was why, you know, sometimes we get a little off the cuff on the show. We drink a little bit too much, but I wanted to make sure we got everything in with you because you, um, you've done so much in soccer. You're covering so many different aspects of soccer right now. And one of them is the U.S. women's national team, who has been in the news quite a bit over the last couple of months. Of course, they just won the World Cup, which was very exciting. And they are arguably the, the best team could be in U.S. soccer history, U.S. history. You can make that argument. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, competition is better now, which was good to see, especially, you know, we covered Netherlands in the 2015 World, Women's World Cup, and yeah. then they have made huge huge leaps and bounds but the biggest thing right now that i want to hit on is jill ellis her mm -hmm. last game just happened this past this past weekend and i found the timing of her leaving suspect mm -hmm. because the women still have to compete in the olympics next year right why did jill decide to leave now I can't speak necessarily for Jill Ellis. I know what she has said publicly, which is that she decided this last December uh, with her family that this was going to be it mm -hmm. for her no matter what happened. I don't actually know if that's true. Right. Um, you know, if they hadn't won this World Cup, would she have stuck around to, to try and, and, and win an Olympic gold medal? The one thing that stands out is no team that has ever won a Women's World Cup has won the gold medal in the Olympics the following year. And that may have been in her mind as well. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I've actually talked to Megan Rapinoe in the past about how difficult it is. And she's like, look, if you win a World Cup like we did in 2015, and then they went out in the quarterfinals of the Olympics yeah. the year after, your life changes after winning a World Cup. And suddenly you're having to do all these different things away from the field. Mm -hmm. And that's good, and you're making money, and you're doing a lot more advertising and getting endorsements that you, maybe you didn't have before. Uh, but it's hard to get back to being totally soccer focused. And I'm curious to see how Megan Rapino does that now, mm -hmm. because she just signed a, a book deal for between like three and four million dollars, and that book deal that book's going to come out next year. Wow! And she hasn't played a ton of soccer since the World Cup for her club team. You know, some of that is due to injury. A lot of that's due to injury. But I think when you win a World Cup, getting it going again for the Olympics is clearly a challenge. Mm -hmm. And so I think we'll see how this U.S. women's team responds to that. Can they win a gold medal next summer and become an unprecedented team. Right. Um, well, I mean, you see in other sports, the back-to-back -back championship is so difficult. Now add this in the fact that you're, you're playing games in many different time zones. You're going around the world and, and you're not with your teammates all the time because you're coming together for these big games. So, and yes, you're doing the marketing, you're doing the incredible parties that we also saw, which, you know, you have every right to do and celebrate a World Cup. Um, there was a lot of, you know, I, you know, I covered Jill Ellis. I always found her. She was, you know, always very helpful and, and nice and, and a real, it seemed like a really genuinely happy person. But I didn't always get that vibe from the players. Is there any, what aspect of truth is there that the players didn't necessarily align with Jill? 
Well, the veterans tried to get Jill Ellis fired <laughs> okay, uh, back in 2017. Like, they went to the U.S. soccer president, uh, Sunil Gulati at the time, and said, we've got huge concerns about Jill Ellis and the direction of this team. And if things don't get addressed, we don't want her around anymore. And this is a history inside this U.S. women's national team. And this goes back to the 1990s uh, with different coaches where the players have a lot of power and... Uh, they've tried to get coaches fired, and they've been successful at certain times and unsuccessful at other times. So Tom Sermani a few years ago right, got yeah. fired after the there was basically a player revolt. Um, the players tried to get April Heinrichs fired before the 2004 Olympics, uh, and the U.S. soccer president at the time said no. They ended up winning the gold medal. Um, and so there's a sort of a fascinating storyline of what happens inside this team uh, I give Jill Ellis a lot of credit for for winning two straight World Cups. I mean, you can she can kind of do a mic drop on that alone right. at this point. Uh, but having to deal with all the stuff inside that team um, and and still be successful, she does deserve some credit for. Unfortunately, Jill Ellis doesn't like me very much because how come? Because. I would report stuff that was true that she didn't want out there, like that the players tried to revolt. You were on doing her. your job. Yeah, I was doing my job. Like I never put out anything that was untrue, but she still was unhappy about it. So like during the World Cup this summer, I would come out a couple hours before kickoff with like Julie Ertz not in the starting lineup. She's picked up an injury. Lindsay Horan not starting against um, against France, and so Jill didn't like that and. I understand. Oh, U.S. soccer didn't like that? I'm so surprised. And, <laughs> no. and, and so I understand that she would be upset with a leak, but don't be upset with me. I'm doing my job. So, yeah, because a, a lot of managers, Jurgen Klinsmann would be one example. He didn't like when I did things like that. I mean, you to a, a greater extent. But I want to track back to what you had said about the players trying to get her fired. Why did they want to get her fired? What was it about her they didn't like? Um, I think for some veterans, it was as simple as I'm not playing as much. Um, for other veterans, it was a time in 2017, especially where there's a lot of experimentation and there were some poor results. Um, I remember the She Believes Cup, they, the U.S. was really bad results wise in that tournament. They were experimenting with a three man back line. They were getting run over by France in one game in D.C., um, and I think the players were like, enough. Um, but what's interesting is, is that they got through that stretch and, and Jill Ellis, to her credit, um, was able to, f to find kind of a new way to play in some ways and really wanted to find more creative players like a Rose Lavelle. And really she stuck with Rose Lavelle through some injuries and that paid off because when the U.S. went out in the quarterfinals of the 2016 Olympics, it was because they didn't really have the creative players to break down a team that was parking the bus defensively and countering mm -hmm. like Sweden did. And in this summer's tournament, they were able to, to break teams down better because there were more skilled players, uh, especially Rose Lavelle, but also like Tobin Heath, players right. like that who can find their way through a lot of defenders. And now the U.S. is left in a position of trying to find um, a, a coach ahead of the Olympics. Whoever comes in is now at a disadvantage because you have to really get things in order. Names out there are NWSL coaches like Vladko Ananovsky and Laura Harvey, both of who have coached to, coached Megan Rapino, for example, yeah, which is probably if we're looking at this from the outside and we don't have a whole lot of time before break. But that's the key right now, because Megan Rapinoe, it seems like, really does control this team, at least publicly. And I think Megan Rapinoe will have an influence on who the next coach is. And so, yeah, I'm trying to find out kind of what's going on behind the scenes. And Kate Markgraf is the newly hired general manager for the U.S. Women's National Team. It's basically her call. She's running the coaching search process. She has said publicly that all things being equal, she'd prefer to have a woman as uh, the national team coach. That's why I think Laura Harvey has yes. sort of the pole position to get that job. Um, but we still don't totally know yet. And, and that hire is going to be made very soon here for ahead of these games in November. Right. And someone who can deal with many of the different egos on this the challenge. It is. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to be tasked with that at all. They're all very incredible women, but to manage them would be 
difficult. Yeah. All right, we got to take a quick time out. We're going to be back with more on Drinks with Banks and our guest, Grant Wall. Hey, we're back here on Drinks with Binks. I'm Julie Stewart Binks. We've got Grant Wall. We're drinking Mezcal Negronis here. We're discussing Jill Ellis and the U.S. Women's National Team. And also another issue, uh, we talk about distractions ahead of the Olympics, is the U.S. women's fight for equality. Mm -hmm. How do you expect this to play out right now? I think eventually there will be a settlement between the U.S. women's players and U.S. soccer, and U.S. soccer will write a big check. And that is what it will come down to. And I don't think either side really wants to have a full court case to mm -hmm. have it go that far because for the U.S. players, the risk, if it goes to court, would be that they don't win. Right. Because public opinion is not the same thing as a court of law in their gender discrimination case. And also, for the, from the U.S. soccer side, the federation side, I don't think they want to go through the process of discovery that would in, be involved in a court case where a lot of things that maybe U.S. soccer doesn't want to get out publicly True. get out. So um, I think both sides, in the end, will have uh, a reason to settle, but the players want to get a big check and deserve a big check, to be Do honest. Do you think this, uh, what's the timeline like? I mean, the the court case, if it happens, would be in the spring ahead of the Olympics. And so neither side wanted that. And no. then the court came out and said, oh, this is the date. And so um, that's another thing that I, gives them a reason, I think, to settle sooner rather than later, because the players want to win a gold medal and they, and they don't really want to be involved in an ongoing court case in the few months before the Olympics. Um, speaking of not getting paid enough. You are working with a company, Sports Illustrated, that was in the news this past week for laying off a, a huge percentage of the staff. Looking at what's happened and still being with the company, what's your takeaway from what happened? I mean, we are right in the middle of this right now. And so I don't have a ton of information yet on like the full strategy um, going forward. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been at Sports Illustrated since 1996. I decided as a kid, after subscribing to it for years, that I wanted to write for Sports Illustrated, and I was actually able to achieve that dream. So, like, to me, the name Sports Illustrated means more than a job. And I just want to see Sports Illustrated make it. And so last Thursday, when the layoffs happened, was truly terrible for the, for the institution and for a lot of my friends and really talented people who lost their jobs. And so that part has been really difficult. Um, and I want to do cool journalism. I w really want to do that with Sports Illustrated, so I hope that can happen. But you might have to check with me again uh, in a few weeks just because I'll have more information by then. You know, it's... It's just modern media, as you know, is unpredictable. It's a difficult business environment. And I just want to see Sports Illustrated be in a position where, you know, it's been around for 65 years. It has this amazing reputation. Um, and I want that to continue. And we still do have some really, really talented mm -hmm. people there. Um, and so, um, you know, we'll see where it goes from here. When you see what you guys have lost, what would you say is the biggest change with like what you have now versus what you had a week ago? Um, we lost some young, really promising talents who I think are going to go on to do really good things at other outlets now. Um, but that's a huge stress for them early on in their career. Um, to have to deal with, you know? Um, and so um, I, I really do, I, you know, I've seen other places have big layoffs, you know, ESPN and others, and I just assume, oh, that person's really talented. They'll latch on somewhere and be able to go on. But what I learned was there are no guarantees mm -hmm. in this business, and some really talented people have to sort of grind and grind to try and find a place to, to work again. So... Um, you know, it's it's something where I hope this is the low point for Sports Illustrated and that um, we can put 
ourselves in a position where not only are we doing talented, you know, or really good work with talented people, but, you know, the business side is is sustainable. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you you grew up wanting to work for Sports Illustrated and it's sort of this, you know, the name in in bright lights, but it's also a very low point for the company. In what way did what happened affect, uh, help, in what way did what happened lose some of its luster? Um, you know, like, it's, it's just really hard to, you know, this wasn't actually the only layoffs we've had, you know, every year that we've been kind of cutting and cutting and cutting. And so, uh, depth of talent goes down, um, you know, where, you know, you you may not have, you know, three or four people in a particular sport now who are really good at what they do. It may be one or two. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, I think that's hard. I, I think, you know, and I'm not a business expert, right? You know, I, I do what I do. Mm-hmm. I try to have an understanding of, of the media situation and who might have a good strategy. Uh, I think everyone's curious to see what the athletic's doing. Right. Um, because and how that's sustainable. Going right. Forward. Because if it is and, you know, their strategy is pretty straightforward, you know, subscription service, but uh, we aren't going to have ads. We're not going to have clickbait stories um and they have a lot of vc money but then the question is once the vc money's not there will that business model Mm -hmm. be sustainable and if it is then i think you'll see other publications following that i mean the new york times their digital strategy seems to be uh working Mm -hmm. for them globally right so and i also cover soccer so I mean, just last week I was in Liverpool interviewing Jurgen Klopp for Sports Illustrated, really the kind of the viewed as the best coach in the world right now. Uh, I was doing reporting in Spain uh, with Brazilian Ronaldo for our Where Are They Now issue. He owns a, a team in La Liga. Um, and they were really excited about being in Sports Illustrated. Right. So the Sports Illustrated name still carries a lot of weight um, in among the people we cover. Um, and one thing I found over the years covering soccer is that the biggest figures in the sport, and most of them are in Europe, uh, coaches, players, clubs, want to be bigger in the U.S. Of course. And they're often willing to provide U.S. media better access than they provide to their own media. Mm. And my kind of business theory has always been to take advantage of we should take advantage of that as U.S. media as much as possible to put good stories and content before the American audience, but also the global audience, which should crave that if you do it on a regular basis. And then you can really monetize that. So uh, maybe I should start my own publication that does that. But I mean, like Sports Illustrated. You heard it here first. uh, Yeah, exactly. But like Sports Illustrated, I think that's something that we could do because like Jurgen Klopp will sit down with, with Sports Illustrated for an hour. Yeah, and that's that is something that uh, a lot of people in Liverpool and covering the Premier League would would die for. Now, uh, I, there's so many things we mentioned. These interviews go by so quickly. We have two of your books here: Masters of Modern Soccer and The Beckham Experiment. There's so much more about you than your career, and I find uh, I think that would be more interesting to have a whole thing on who is Grant Wall. But number one, what kind of book would you want to write next if you do decide to write a book? I think I would like to write another book. Um, I want it to be on women's soccer, actually, because coming out of the Women's World Cup this summer, obviously you have a U.S. team that's extremely popular and wins World Cups. But one of the big takeaways was the international growth of women's soccer, Mm -hmm. that other countries now are getting big television audiences for this tournament. Like Brazil had the highest domestic television audience ever for a Women's World Cup game bigger even than the 2015 final audience was in the U.S. So, you know, countries like Brazil, but all over Europe and and in other places had record audiences. And FIFA now is finally doing more than it was before to support the women's game. So Johnny Infantino announced he's the FIFA president at the end of the Women's World Cup. Actually, we're going to put FIFA is going to put a billion dollars over the next four years into the grassroots growth of the women's game. Oh. And so then that becomes a really interesting story to follow. So I'd like to follow over the next few years the US women's team, but also this parallel plot of other countries hopefully getting that money because with FIFA you never know if like you that money goes to where it's supposed to go. 
hopefully it will, but to kind of check up on that and tell the stories of women in these developing women's soccer countries, some of which are actually big soccer countries right. that have never really embraced and supported the women's, women's side. Yeah, and that, uh, as, as we know, we talk so much about the U.S. here. We are very U.S.-centric, and, and their story is incredible, but sometimes overshadows some of those that are just as interesting and incredible around the world. So we will have to stay tuned for that book, and we'll be back after a quick timeout on Drinks of Things. Welcome back. It's Drinks with Binks. I'm JSB. We've got Grant Wall. Grant, we know so much about you, SI, soccer. But what else do you want to pursue going forward that's that's off the pitch? Um, I want to do more work in Spanish. Hmm. Um, and obviously there's a lot of Spanish language soccer media in the U.S. But uh, like once I finished my most recent book, this was a couple years ago, I was like, um, I want to get my Spanish back up to 100% where I can work in it. And uh, and so I did that. I took a lesson every week. It wasn't even a lesson. I got together with a Spanish-speaking uh, guy, young uh, Argentine, who wanted to learn more about the U.S. soccer landscape. And so he would meet with me, and we would spend 60, 90 minutes a week um, talking in Spanish, where he learned about how about the U.S. soccer landscape worked, and I was able to work on my Spanish. And so uh, it was a fun process. And so, like, I'd like to do that. I think there's not too many people who work in both English language soccer media in the U.S. and Spanish mm -hmm. language. So Telemundo or Univision, if you're hearing this. Um, well, that, that's the biggest disadvantage we have covering soccer in the States. But I do want to ask you, though, that's still a work thing. It is still a work thing. That's what true. else? We, we only have about a minute left. I am, I am big into fitness, okay. like crazy big into fitness. Uh, I do uh, work out at a rowing studio four mm -hmm. times a week here in, in New York City. I, I highly suggest it. I'm in the best shape, actually, I've been since high school. Um, wow. I lift twice a week. Uh, with a trainer. My wife got us into doing this. And so, like, I, I had a good moment last week. Jurgen Klopp actually said, you've been at Sports Illustrated for 23 years. What, did you start when you were 12? And, <laughs> and so hopefully uh, that can continue to be said. Well, we're taking you back by having Negronis making sure your fitness regime <laughs> is not that good today. Uh, we got to take a quick time out here, but we're going to have a little bit more on Drinks with Binks and Grant Wall. All right, it's Drinks with Binks with Grant Wall. Grant, where can we see you next? What story are you working on? I'm working on a Sports Illustrated magazine story on Jurgen Klopp, the Liverpool manager. Um, they're perfect right now in the Premier League. Um, and maybe one of the, you could argue, maybe the best coach in any sport in the world. I know that's a talk radio type debate, but you could at least make that argument. Uh, I'm also looking forward to covering the NWSL final for Sports Illustrated. I haven't done that in a while, yes. but like, I think it's a good sign for our coverage of women's soccer. Yes, and we are very pro women's soccer on the show and excited to learn more about Jurgen Klopp as he is also quite a fascinating personality. Thank you so much for watching us here today. You can follow Grant on Twitter also on Instagram, and stay with us here because next week we have Adnan Verk from DAZN. Drink and bink all you want. Have a great weekend, folks. We'll see you next time.